The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God be merciful. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but on the side of humans. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let that one deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save one's life will lose it, and whoever loses one's life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a person if that one gains the whole world and yet forfeits that one's life? Or what shall a person give in return for one's life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and hardly ever the way that we would want or desire. It's evident that the one who was named Rocky, on whom Christ and the confession of that faith would build the church, is now the one who becomes a different kind of rock, a scandalon, a stumbling block, because he did not want to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, but my kingdom come, my will be done. It is in the ongoing challenge of seeing that our ways and our life and our desires are not often the way that God would have things unfold. The Holy Spirit, given by the Father, had revealed to St. Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And from there, Jesus begins to explain to his disciples that he must, it is necessary, it is unavoidable for him to go to Jerusalem, the city of peace, and for Jesus to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and eventually for Jesus to be killed and on the third day be raised. How fascinating it is that it appears the disciples had been fixated on the first parts of Jesus' statement. He must go to Jerusalem to suffer under many leaders and be killed. And yet there's very little interest they seem to have on his being raised from the dead. Instead, focused on the bad things, focused on the immediate pain, focused on the immediate tribulation and trial, Jesus decides to take G Peter decides to take Jesus under his wing. And Peter pretends to be the father figure, the one who can gather Jesus under his arm and correct him and pray on his behalf. Oh God, let this not be done. Oh God, have mercy. Oh God, do not let this be the case. And yet, it is Jesus who corrects him. Get thee behind me, Satan. This should be something that echoes in our ears before the COVID-19 pandemic, when we had opportunity to gather on the first Sunday in Lent. There, as Jesus had been hurled into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil, he went against the devil because the devil was against him. 
challenging him to turn stones into bread, challenging him to jump off of the Temple Mount, and challenging him to bow down before Satan that he might gain all of the wealth and riches of the world. And what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. To get behind one is a very visual thing. I want you to think about it that way. Because unless you are a mother or a father or a kindergarten teacher, you don't have eyes behind your head. Your eyes are in front. And where you're facing is what you see. And when you're looking in front, you don't see those things behind. Get behind me, Satan, as Jesus sees Satan as a hindrance, as a stumbling block. And in that same vein calls us to say the same thing to Satan. Get behind. I don't want to look at Satan's way. I want to go in the way of the Lord. Get behind me, stumbling block, accuser, deceiver, Satan. You're hindering me. Because in Matthew chapter 4, Satan was trying to get Jesus not to suffer and die on the cross. Not to fast, not to pray, and not to give the greatest alms of his life by hanging on a cross for you and for me so that he could rise again from the dead and bring salvation to us all. And would you believe that right here, as St. Peter has already made the great confession of faith, that Jesus is faced with the very same challenge, the same kind of deceit, the same kind of hindrance, the same type of way that leads people in a different direction, and Jesus is not afraid to call Peter Satan. He's not afraid to label bad, bad. And he's not afraid to call those who others may see as a rock, as a stumbling rock, a stumbling stone instead. Because Peter did not have his mind on the things of God, but on the things of humans. Don't be so quick to be so hard on Peter yourself, thinking that any of us would have done far better. As a matter of fact, in our world, we know full well that we had been singing the song long before Frank Sinatra, and we've been wanting it our way for a long, long time. Our way, politically, our way, economically, our way, educationally, our way, relationally, our way, in a familial fashion. It always has to be our way. And we get upset at our children, especially the little ones when they have their temper tantrums and they stomp their feet on the ground and they pout and they cry. And we say, oh, you're just a stubborn little child. You just can't have everything your way. You know, that same thing could be said to all of us. We are all stubborn little children who want everything to go the way we anticipate it. And don't be afraid to recognize that it is indeed the pot calling the kettle black, for your pastor is a planner and loves to make sure that things fit together properly. And I speak to all the planners out there, and I say, sometimes your plans are not God's plans. Sometimes. Your perspective is not God's perspective. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And you might think that you're free to not have to wear a mask around other people, to not maintain a social or physical distance, to not have to wash your hands or worry about things. But you know what? You're not in charge of life. You are not the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as a matter of fact, when left to our own devices for our way to be the only way, we find ourselves failing miserably. It was Peter, the same one, who bid Jesus to tell him, walk on the water. Let me walk on the water out to you, insisting that it be on Peter's terms. 
And Jesus even complies and allows him to come. But then Peter, having it in his own way, wants to look at the wind and the stock market and the interest rates and the school plans and the webinars and the news and the media, and he starts to sink in the water. He's not the only one sinking in the water. All of us find ourselves sinking in that same water as we find ourselves in Peter's shoes. Hard to receive the words that Jesus brings. If anyone wants to come after me, let that one deny oneself and take up one's cross and follow me. One could argue that in today's world, as it has been for many, many years, our country, our nation, our state, our city, our people have experienced what come, some would call a crisis of leadership. And you don't have to look far to recognize this crisis of leadership. But I would contend that more than a crisis of leadership, there is a crisis of followership. No one wants to follow the one who is the leader. People do not wants to deny themselves, to take their own thoughts and their own ways and their own plans and put them on the side and on the back burner, as a matter of fact, to put them behind and not look at them again and take up whatever cross God has given you and follow in the way of Jesus. Thanks be to God, Jesus, sought his father's will in the garden of Gethsemane, praying, not my will, but yours be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And because of that, Jesus suffered and died on the cross for us. And because of that, he rose from the dead for us to save us. And it was not on our terms. It was not our way. It would not have been our design and it would not have been our plan. But I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to hurt you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. I may have sat alone because your hand was heavy upon me, for you had filled me with indignation as my pain is unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed. Even when I think of God as a deceitful brook like waters that fail, you, the Lord, continue to say, if you return to me, I will restore you. If you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow, if you say, get behind me, Satan, I know thee not. And if you utter those things, turning back to the Lord, you will see that the evil will not prevail against you. For although Jesus died on the cross and Satan and his minions may have thought it was the time of their great victory, hallelujah, we know that Jesus rose from the dead. And death itself has been defeated. Death itself has been defeated. And as death is defeated for us, they may fight against us, but hallelujah, they shall not prevail against us. For as Jeremiah reminds us, the Lord says, I am with you to save you and deliver you. And it's going to all be on his terms. This is not an easy thing for us to swallow, is it, Redeemer? It's not easy when someone tells us that we have to stay apart from each other when we want to hug and hold each other. It goes against our grain to believe that we can't gather as family as we used to, as friends coming over casually with each other. It goes against our own internal DNA to think that somebody else can tell us what the rules have to be. But in reality, we recognize that our lives are hidden with Christ in God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why today at our 11 o'clock liturgy, by God's grace, Tommy Robin Williams Lee is going to be baptized into Christ. This little girl is going to drown and be raised in those waters of baptism and be connected with the one who says, get behind me, Satan, and stay in front of me, Jerusalem, city of peace. For it is not my will, 
but God's will that will be done. I tell you, Tommy Robin Williams Lee is a cute little girl. And she's all practiced and ready for her baptism today. But I can assure you that Tommy's life is not going to be perfect. Do you know why? Because I look at a lot of little girls and women and boys and men in this call and in this sermon today for whom life has not been perfect either. I know that you are dealing with the struggles and trials of understanding God's will that doesn't make a bit of sense. And I know that as a people, we have experienced how those who are great and phenomenal actors, those who have graced the screen and embodied the great heroes of the past and the heroes even of make-believe, who have felt that actors of that kind of genre and actors of that caliber would allow things to go on eternally. But sadly, sadly, in his 40s, we see that not even Wakanda is forever. A tragic loss, to be sure, but not nearly as tragic for us as the other loss that hits even closer to home as another one of our heroes, a husband, a father, a son-in-law, taken like a thief in the night. How do we put this together? How can we but say with Peter, forbid it, Lord, let it not be like this. And yet also in his 40s, also as quick as the night may come, we see Gabe now resting in the arms of Jesus. What do we do? How can we respond? We pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And we realize that the same God who brought Gabe and brought Chadwick and who brings Tommy and who saved Peter is the same God who rescues Melissa and Roxy and Rebecca and Tula and Wendy and Kless, who rescues all of God's children and holds them in the arms of his mercy and says, it will be the way of the cross. It will be the way of suffering. It will be the way of pain. And they may fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you. I shall save you, my beloved. I shall deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hands of wicked anxiety. I will rescue you from the clutches of depression. I will redeem you from your fears and from your sorrows, and I will grab you out of the grasp of the ruthless. And you in this trial, you on the way of the cross, you with your eyes set toward Jerusalem, the holy city, you will know anew that I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you with my powerful right hand. Jesus Christ was 33 years old when he suffered on the cross and died for us. And yet he knew those words that would be marked in scripture by the Holy Apostle Paul. Never avenge yourselves, but leave things to the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So when people are hungry, we feed them. When they're thirsty, we give them things to drink. We don't moan. We don't complain, but we cherish every moment and every person and every minute and every hour that God spares us life. 
as we are not overcome by evil, but as we overcome evil with good. In the great hymn of the church, why should cross and trial grieve me? Christ is near with his cheer. Never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the heaven that God's son for me won when his life is given? When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. Hallelujah. God, my loving Savior, sends them. And he who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God gives me my days of gladness. Hallelujah. And I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. Because God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. His love attends me day by day. Come what may, he guides me and defends me. You know, Tommy Robin Williams Lee's life is not going to be easy. It's not going to be perfect after all. She has a pulse. She has blood. She has a brain. She has lungs. She's a human. Life is hard for us. But I can tell her what I tell you, my dear sisters and brothers, from God's joy can nothing sever, for I am his dear lamb, and he's my shepherd ever. Chadwick and Gabe and Blanche are all God's dear lambs. I am his because he gave me his own blood for my good, and by his death he saves me. Nothing can separate Chadwick, nothing can separate Gabriel, nothing can separate Blanche, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So let it be the way of the cross. Let it be the way of suffering. Let the chief priests and the scribes and the elders be against us. Let the world clamor with its craziness and let all of the rules seem to try to paralyze and cripple us. But you know, my friends, nothing changes the fact that now in Christ, not even death can slay me. Though it might day and night trouble and dismay me, Christ has made death a portal from the strife of this life to his joy immortal. As Tommy and Gabe, as Chadwick and Blanche, and so many others are on this journey of faith with us, dear sisters and brothers, be bold in submitting to God's will. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, Lord, forbid it, Peter said. But walk by faith, my children. Don't grow weary. He has you. He's got you. And he's going to carry you even through this. And you're going to see anew how he's been the one who's joined you on the journey. The despised and rejected Jesus who suffered to release us, who brings salvation, hope, and peace to us, says that on the great getting up day when he returns, that we shall see the Son of God return in his glory. That day's coming, my friends, a new creation. All the dead in Christ shall rise and give him glory and honor. And until that time, church, I adjure you, I beg you, I plead with you. Please pray with Jesus and pray with those who can't even get the words out of their mouths. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, to the glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.